Welcome to Chautauqua People. My guest today is Bester Cram. He comes from a well-established Chautauqua family and gained his name from Arthur Bester, who, his grandfather, who served as institution president for 25 years. Bester spent his childhood in New York City and Bronxville, New York, and was a summer Chautauquan. After graduation from Denison University in Ohio, he joined the Marine Corps, became a combat engineer officer, served in Vietnam during the Tet Offensive, and submitted a request for conscientious objector status upon his return to the United States. He did graduate work in England and then founded Northern Light Productions, a Boston-based leading producer of feature-length documentaries and specialty products for museums and the service branches. Bester now spends about two weeks per season at Chautauqua and has been showing his films for 12 years here. The Last American Colony will have an initial screening this summer. The documentary reveals Puerto Rico's history and relationship with the United States through the eyes of Juan Segarra, a Harvard-educated man who chose to embrace the independence movement and became a member of Los Macheteros, a group dedicated to achieving its goals through armed struggle. Esther, what was your childhood like at Chautauqua? Well, the childhood was uh, obviously something that provided a foundation of love and uh, joy with family and um, a sense of um, understanding independence. Chautauqua is a wonderful place where, as a child, you get to be on your own, do things on your own. The supervision is always there, but you feel actually in some respects, you feel very empowered to head off on your own and make, make your life for yourself. Even as a five or six year old, even as just going off to the creek to look for <coughs> a crawfish or something like that, this is a choice that you're making. And, and actually, you no know, one's over your shoulder. It, it, it was a great childhood experience to be here. It was also a, a time in which my mother and my grandmother um, were both alive and were both here. My father would come and visit uh, during our time at Ch during Chautauqua, but we were always staying with my grandmother. And um, she was a woman who, you know, clearly had a long history of uh, her life here um, at Chautauqua. And, and there were ways in which I think, you know, I was introduced to the, um, even parts of the 19th century living with her. Mm -hmm. And what effect did Chautauqua experience have upon developing your personality? Well, such an interesting question, John. You know, I think all Chautauquans, I have to believe, in some respects, are uh, enamored with the fact that um, this is not just a summer resort. This is not just a place where it's um, the interest of going into the, the lake is the paramount thing that you're doing. You're actually surrounded on a daily basis with challenges of what are the assumptions you've made about the world and made, your, made about your own place in the world? And so you're amongst a ongoing conversation that is constantly having you rethink what you know, what you think you want to know, and what you think maybe you ought to know. And it becomes a place where Chautauqua, I think, has an enormous influence upon your sense of um, challenging yourself to be a curious individual. There are all sorts of different issues that come up, all sorts of uh, issues regarding uh, moral issues, issues of um, the meaning of friendships, the issues of understanding the differences between different generations and the way in which we all communicate and understand and are empathetic with one another. Um, I'm always reminded too that for me, um, and I think for many others, but in Norton Hall, over the uh, proscenium stage, um, there is a uh, uh, great engraving that was put in there called um, All Passes Art Alone Endures. And um, for my family, there are many arts or Arthurs in the family. And so, of course, we always took that to be a personal inscription. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And so um, you're enduring here. As, we are enduring. <laughs> as, as goes on. Now, we've talked a little bit about the role of documentaries. I wonder if you could explain where you come and what's their role in our literature of the times. Well, uh, great phrase, literature of the times, and I think you know 
uh, the, both of us have an understanding of how important the motion picture is in our lives today in all its various different forms, whether it be television, um, what happens on the phone, um, certainly movie theaters as a kind of an origin of where uh, you and I became accustomed to the impact that uh, motion pictures and particularly what documentaries could have upon us. But I think that you know the nonfiction cinema um, is a uh, type of literature that relies very much on storytellers who are authentic. And it's not something that a writer has decided to put the words into somebody's mind or put them into their own, their voice. The, the bearing witness, the, the voice that comes from a storyteller that has uh, essentially experienced a life that they're talking about is something in which you trust in an entirely different way. There may be entertainment value that goes along with it, much the same way as there is um, a variety of different kinds of emotional experiences and contexts that we have with narrative film, but non-narrative, in a sense, um, it begs you to trust the authenticity of what is being shared, which means that as documentarians, actually, we carry a great deal of responsibility in that we are um, handling essentially that trust that's been expressed to us by audiences, that, ex that expectation that we will be truth tellers in terms of the way we make the films. Not all documentarians are that way. And Absolutely. documentary has always been sort of a, a very fluid thing. We, documentaries are used for propaganda, whether in good purposes or bad. We saw in the Second World War, for sure, the, the documentary that was created by the U.S. Army was very important in terms of being able to communicate a particular a, understanding of what was taking place far away, either over in the th <coughs> theater of the Europe or in the Pacific theater. And equally, what uh, Hitler was doing was creating documentaries, um, particularly <coughs> with uh, Lenny, uh, Lenny Reifenstahl, that became pieces of art, but also hor horrendous invitations to uh, people to, to change the way in which they think and be, to become intolerant of others. Very powerful medium, documentary. So how did you come to be interested in producing them? I think it was partially understanding that particular uh, sense of the medium. I, I look back um, in terms of the kinds of films that I began to see when I was um, in school. Um, but probably the film that stands out the most actually was a film um, that captured my imagination when I came back from Vietnam. It was called Hearts and Minds. And Hearts and Minds was kind of a, an essay of all the various different ways in which we prepare our young men, that was really the thesis of the film at that particular time, uh, to go into combat. And whether it be in our um, social forums, uh, certainly in the athletics, um, a variety of different ways in which the expectation of becoming a soldier and the conduct of what that aspect is was powerfully uh, investigated in Hearts of the Minds. And uh, it was a film made by Peter Davis, uh, somebody that I admire uh, for his work. It was a very manipulated film. Mm -hmm. You could say, you know, there was uh, some lines here in which uh, the documentary uh, voice was being shaped in a particular manner. Um, and that, uh, I think that captured my imagination, recognizing that this can be a tool for good, this can be a tool certainly to advance a particular perspective. Um, it's a tool that we have to be very careful about, particularly in terms of how we examine it today. And I think we live in an age today where much more so now the, the notion of, of what lies as a truth within the nonfiction world, whether particularly when it, uh, we see it on television and in the 24-7 newscasts. I think we're, we're all accustomed to not so much what uh, Washington would call fake news, but much more sort of the predominance of not having a bias, but having very much a bias in terms of the way in which the news is being presented and therefore what is being included and what's being excluded. 
Right. Now, did you come out of Denison at a university loaded for this kind of work, or were you, did this sort of develop in those years after college? I think it uh, developed in the years after college. I, I was in, uh, I, I studied economics as a major, and I did theater as a, as a minor. And I think during the, in the aspects of theater, theater has always been a world where you hear a voice presenting a story. And in some respects, live theater more than any other form of performance, you have to trust that voice if you're going to believe the theater. And so uh, I was very enamored with the notion of how important the voice was. Um, I did radio when I was at uh, Denison as well, and so that's another aspect of shaping the voice to uh, present a particular tone to what it is that you're, you're, you're talking about, uh, even if it's just the reading of the news. Uh, but it was clearly, um, uh, I think, the examination that I went through uh, personally um, while I was in Vietnam and then uh, politically when I came back from Vietnam uh, that probably caused me to recognize that documentary work was in concert with sort of the ways in which my life had evolved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that fit then. Now, you, can you tell me a little bit about your company, what it's like, and sorts of projects you do? Well, Northern Light Productions is a company of 35 artists. Um, it, we have people who are represent all uh, ages. Um, I am the oldest there, but uh, there are uh, just uh, very young people, but uh, also people who have been in this business for quite some time. Um, they are writers. They are um, actors, they are camera people, they are sound recordists, they are editors, they are uh, people now going beyond the linear uh, aspect of filmmaking. Um, now in the non-linear or interactive immersive world, we have people that are programmers, they are developers creating interactive experiences, um, games. Um, oftentimes uh, we're also doing very large uh, film projects and sometimes we're pushing sort of the technical envelope to work in the virtual reality world. Um, I would say that, you know, the theme is always nonfiction, but there's quite a spectrum of how that nonfiction takes place in terms of what it is we're trying to accomplish. But it's a, it's a diverse population of people. You know, one of the interesting things that I learned a, a while ago as we were looking at the demographics of universities is that there are more people studying in the communications department than any other departments these days across the country. There are really? people, people that are so enamored with understanding and participating in the ways in which we communicate with one another. Now, I think that suggests uh, both the access and the language that you had talked about in terms of being the predominant way in which we communicate with one another. Um, but I think it represents also, um, you know, a, 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 an easily understood access to the world of work. People grow up with a great deal of uh, imagination and understanding. Oh, I know how to put pictures and sound together and stories. Uh, people that are now um, working in studios like the one we're in right now who are uh, elementary school kids. Mm -hmm. They start off the day with a little news story that they've created. I mean, the, the world of the, the, the broad world of communication is around us uh, to the point that, you know, we are completely saturated by it. Indeed, indeed. And so Northern Light does this variety of items, and, and Boston, I assume, is a good place to recruit people and to, to do projects. Well, Boston having as many universities as it has, it's not quite as many as you have down in, uh, we have a few more than you have down in Raleigh, Indeed. in that whole <coughs> triangle area. I think there are, within the metro Boston area, there's 100 universities. And um, that means that there's an awful lot of people that are, um, there are young people that are coming out and are oftentimes engaged in internships in a variety of different places. We run a very active internship program, so we're immediately getting in touch with young people that are, want to actually be in a kind of an environment that we're in. Um, but I, there, there's also, I think, uh, Boston has become a center for one aspect of the work we do, which is creating media exhibits for museums. 
And those media exhibits sometimes take the are, are orientation films in a large theater. Other times they are very specific uh, kiosk elements that might be a part of a museum in science or they might actually be a portrait of an artist that goes along with a, uh, in an art museum. Uh, there are so many different types of media uses right now, um, also including the, the very familiar audio tours that are going on that uh, help people when they go to different exhibits. Boston is a center for this. There are quite a few companies. We're not alone there. <laughs> There's a mm -hmm. lot of competition. Mm -hmm. But all of the competition is operating on a national level. So we're doing work in California, or we're doing work down south, we're doing work in Canada, we may be doing work in Israel later on this year. All of the, it's, it's a place where there's a lot of folks that have a lot of interest. And I think it's that intersection, particularly in the museum world, but the documentary world in general, is an intersection of people that uh, realize and are curious about how one communicates both to the heart as well as to the mind. You can persuade the mind to believe something, but you can persuade the heart in some way to actually accept the meaning of what that belief is because you feel it. And that's the beauty of this, this medium in a way. It is something to be felt. And, and so the, go back a little bit, the notion that museums are full of cabinets with glass full of stuff and it just sits there. Well, they're still filled with stuff. They've got a lot of stuff, but that's now in the back room that's oftentimes. Right. That's right. And uh, yeah, and there are some museums that are created that actually have no artifacts whatsoever. We did the International Spy Museum, and when that was first opened, we created something like 40 different media exhibits, but it actually had no artifacts. It had to go and collect from a few people in the intelligence community mm -hmm. that had acquired different uh, artifacts from various different uh, intelligence escapades, and they became sort of the, the heart of an exhibit, but it wasn't like there was a, a warehouse filled of artifacts. And I think there's quite a few museums that are very, very digitally oriented in that particular way. Um, that's not to say that you know the Smithsonian doesn't have these sort of glass um, cases with extraordinarily interesting artifacts from the, some dinosaur age or whatever. But I think what happens with the medium of, of the, with the media itself is that the stories are much more easily told in a visual format. And those stories are they're told in a manner that we're used to actually encountering. So even though you might be looking at a particular artifact, there's right there is a television monitor that's giving you the story that's equated with that particular artifact. And many museums now, the artifact is actually put into storage and we're, all we're doing is, you know, we may actually be operating a joystick to, to look at the skull of some animal or whatever to move around it and then essentially digitally touch it in ways that we couldn't when it was in, in, a, uh, in a glass case. And probably one of my favorite museums is the British Museum in London. And I'm thinking that's all dead stuff in cases. It is. And maybe we need to go and <laughs> pull them into the 21st century. Well. In London are some of the best up-to-date 21st century museums as well. The War Museum is a phenomenal museum. Uh, the Museum of London is an extraordinary museum, and they have many, many different media elements. But the common, uh, again, to say what's common about these museums that are successful is that they all recognize that story is at the heart of how we understand each other and how we learn things mm -hmm. and how we are interested in things. We like to know how a story unfolds. Now let me talk about story for just a minute. Bester, um, I've been to several of your productions that are shown here in the Chautauqua Theater and last year there was a, a film on Vietnam, people doing art. We talked, it talked tangentially but substantively about Agent Orange. This year it's one about Puerto Rico. How do you develop, the, and, and that needs to be told, um, how long does a project take and how do you develop them, these ideas? Well, all of these projects take way longer than anybody would imagine and, 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 and in some respect from a business point of view, some of them uh, work, to, but those that take a long time um, have a really difficult time being justified financially, I suppose. But, um, so I, the, the film that we're showing 
here this year, um, The Last American Colony, One Man's Revolution. It began back in 2005, and we're now in 2019, so it's almost a, you know, a full 15-year arc of, of production. Not continuous production, but when it was started, and then uh, finally when we concluded it. The camouflage, uh, Vietnamese artists, uh, Vietnamese brushstrokes with history that you mentioned, which has to do with uh, Vietnamese artists um, covering uh, a century, more than a century of work as artists interpreting what is happening, because it goes all the way back to Dien Bien Phu uh, and before. Um, these artists, uh, this was a project that was done over a period of just two years. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a fairly compressed, I mean it was two trips, three trips actually to Vietnam and then an editorial process to pull together what ends up being a 75 minute film. That particular film, I'm doing all of the directing, shooting, lighting, sound recording, editing. I have a friend of mine who's an artist and he was the producer interviewer. So it was a very small, compact group. Now, uh, other films are much larger and take much longer. I think if I was honest in answering your question though about where the ideas come from, it's in some respects uh, reacting badly to the notion that tell stories that you know, mm -hmm. which is one of the things that people say. You should you know, talk about what you do know. I actually am curious and like to find out what I don't know. And so uh, oftentimes it's kind of uncovering by accident a surprise that just is being turned on to me by a conversation with somebody like yourself. Um, or sometimes it's personal research where I delve into a particular issue. Um, Puerto Rico, I think I always knew as an island and that most people who had been to it had gone to beaches. And I really knew so little. And it was only when until uh, somebody was actually a Puerto Rican who was working in my company, who was a cinematographer and a person, person who had been a former student of mine where I um, taught uh, cinematography to this individual. Um, he began to open up my eyes in terms of understanding a particular history that had shaped his view of both Puerto Rico as well as the United States. And I thought, oh, well, there's more here to be learned. And there was an extraordinary amount to be learned. And I think it was um, that project had staying power. Not all projects do. I mean, this one had staying power over a period of 15 years to finally come to fruition. The timing of it couldn't have been better given the current events that have taken place because uh, we do use sort of uh, the U.S. reaction to how we supported the Puerto Ricans after Hurricane Maria as kind of a mirror of the way in which the United States has actually had a relationship with its territory, Puerto Rico, over more than 100 years. But I think there's also another reason why uh, certain projects interest me. Mm -hmm. I spent 13 months in Vietnam, Tet 68 to Tet 69. The world changed. I was different when I came back, but during that particular period, I think this country made some seismic shifts. The politics, the people who were in office, the music, the way in which the language was a way in which we communicated, the divisions and the things that united us changed. And I've found that actually quite a few of the films that I have made have been trying to figure out, okay, what happened? Mm -hmm. I changed. <laughs> I clearly changed as a result of that period of time at, in war. And of course, you know, when you're at war, you're not in war or in combat all the time, yeah. not at all. So you have a great deal of time to think. But probably more importantly is when I came back and then filed a conscientious objector status, that was uh, myself wanting to take a stand. Mm -hmm. And I became a, one of the organizers for Vietnam Veterans Against the War, worked very closely with John Kerry on that activist activity. And I think that the combination of that and recognizing that uh, there were stories that we were telling uh, a population back here that um, first we had uh, authenticity because we were veterans and so the stories we told came with some different type of interpretation than a news 
reporter might have made. Mm -hmm. And secondly, um, we were uh, joining a larger peace movement, but we were different than the members of the peace movement. We were not refuseniks. We were not people that had said no. We were people that actually, for all sorts of different reasons, but generally out of some sense of our own patriotism, had joined the military. When I was in the Marine Corps, all the people in my that I came in contact with were, were volunteers. Mm -hmm. Even though the Marines ha did have people that were um, drafted, m uh, the, the people that were under my command, particularly in Vietnam, were all, like myself, volunteers. And I think we all went through an education. We all went through a challenge of trying to understand what it was that we had volunteered for. We knew our country was at war. We believed our leaders to be telling us the truth. We found out later that that was not always the case. It challenged a great deal of things. I don't think it challenged our sense of, of um, allegiance at all to our citizenship in this country, but it, under, it changed the way in which we began to trust the voices coming, particularly coming from, from Washington. And I, just to close on that, all of that notion of I needed to look more deeply, I could not accept things as they were, was very much a part of the way in which I began to choose projects that I was interested in. Sometimes the projects came out of experiences or stories that we learned in the museum world. Right. And I felt like, oh, this is fascinating, this could make a feature length film. Long answer, sorry, John, but I hope that that I'm, is helpful. magnificent. I've got one last question. We're nearly out of time. I'd like to shape this question for most people who've had substantive careers. And one of the things that we say in my family is we do more parenting at Chautauqua than we do back in home, be it in California, North Carolina, or New York City. If a young Chautauquan came to you and said, Mr. Cram, I'm interested in a career in documentary work. What advice would you offer that young Chautauquan? Well, I think that I would say I would be very encouraging, but also uh, remind one that this is, uh, we live in an age right now where we celebrate uh, the capacity for somebody to pay off all of their education bills quickly, to uh, move forward in a manner that um, provides you with a roadmap of success. Mm -hmm. The documentary world does not provide that. You don't get rich quickly, you don't get rich. And you're creating your own path. So there's an entrepreneurial nature that is required of the documentary filmmaker. It's not just always the ability to kind of think through a story. There is a sense of you know, feeling comfortable in a risk-taking environment. That will be the great guide for you to be successful. And I hope, I hope <laughs> they do it because I, I, what little work I do, small compared to yours, is immensely satisfying. And we are out of time. What else do we need to talk about? <laughs> we always like to give somebody the opportunity for points that you want to close on. Well, you know, I was going to tell you a wonderful story about my mom who, you know, was here. She lived for 101 years. Goodness. And so all 101 years of her life, she came to Chautauqua. And uh, I think in her 97th year, she was at Old First Night. Mm -hmm. And uh, they always ask you, all the people to stand up. And then they go through and they say, okay, sit down if you've been, if you haven't been here 70 years. And then 75, okay, and then 80. They got to 95 and she was still standing. She looked around and was wondering where, are there any other people? And there were a couple of people standing and then it went up to 96. There was one other person standing up on the row. It went to 97, and then went to 98. And my mom had to sit down. She was thinking, oh, how could somebody else be here older than me and still standing up there? She was heartbroken. <laughs> we later learned that the person actually suffered from a little bit of dementia, didn't actually know how old she was, and she was considerably uh. less. <laughs> so my mother never got the pleasure of being the last woman standing, but she, your, she your deserved mom, it. Your mom was cheated. <laughs> she deserved it. <laughs> well, maybe she's looking down on us now. And I, saying, bet you, I bet you she is. And saying, hey, Bester did it for me, because <laughs> this will be seen by lots of folks along the way. Good. We are out of time, Good. and this is so much fun. I hope you'll come back. Good. It's been a pleasure, thank John. You so thank much. you so much. By I really means. enjoyed it. You bet.